Tuck Everlasting, Chapter 1. The road that led to Tree Gap had been trod out long before by a herd of cows who were, to say the least, relaxed. It wandered along in curves and easy angles, swayed off and up in a pleasant tangent to the top of a small hill, ambled down again between fringes of bee-hung clover, and then cut sideways across a meadow. Here its edges blurred. It widened and seemed to pause, suggesting tranquil bovine picnics, slow chewing and thoughtful contemplation of the infinite. And then it went on again and came at last to the wood. But on reaching the shadows of the first trees, it veered sharply, swung out in a wide arc as if for the first time it had reasons to think where it was going and passed around. On the other side of the wood, the sense of easiness dissolved. The road no longer belonged to the cows. It became instead, and rather abruptly, the property of people. And all at once the sun was uncomfortably hot, the dust oppressive, and the meager grass along its edges somewhat ragged and forlorn. On the left stood the first house, a square and solid cottage with a touch-me-not appearance, surrounded by grass cut painfully to the quick and enclosed by a capable iron fence some four feet high which clearly said, move on, we don't want you here. So the road went humbly by and made its way past cottages, more and more frequent but less and less forbidding, into the village. But the village doesn't matter, except for the jailhouse and the gallows. The first house only is important. The first house, the road, and the wood. There was something strange about the wood. If the look of the first house suggested that you'd better pass it by, so did the look of the wood, but for quite a different reason. The house was so proud of itself that you wanted to make a lot of noise as you passed and maybe even throw a rock or two. But the wood had a sleeping, other world appearance that made you want to speak in whispers. This at least is what the cows must have thought. Let it keep its peace. We won't disturb it. Whether the people felt that way about the wood or not is difficult to say. There were some perhaps who did, but for most part, the people followed the road around the wood because that was the way it led. There was no road through the wood, and anyway, for the people, there was another reason to leave the wood to itself. It belonged to the Fosters, the owners of the Touch Me Not Cottage, and was therefore private property, in spite of the fact that it lay outside the fence and was perfectly accessible. The ownership of land is an odd thing when you come to think of it. How deep, after all, can it go? If a person owns a piece of land, does he own it all the way down, in ever-narrowing dimensions till it meets all other pieces at the center of the earth? Or does its ownership consist only of a thin crust under which the friendly worms have never heard of trespassing? In any case, the wood being on top, except of course for its roots, was owned but and through by the Fosters in the Touch Me Not, Touch Me Not Cottage. And if they never went there, if they never wandered in among the trees, well, that was their affair. Winnie, the only child of the house, never went there. Though she sometimes stood inside the fence, carelessly banging a stick against the iron bars and looked at it. But she had never been curious about it. Nothing ever seems interesting when it belongs to you, only when it doesn't. And what is interesting anyway about a slim few acres of trees? There will be a dimness shot through the bars of sunlight, a great many squirrels and birds, a deep damp mattress of leaves on the ground, and all other things just as familiar, if not so pleasant, things like spiders, thorns, and grubs. In the end, however, it was the cows who were responsible for the woods isolation, and the cows, through some wisdom they were not wise enough to know that they possessed, were very wise indeed. If they had made their road through the wood instead of around it, then the people would have followed the road. The people would have noticed the giant ash tree at the center of the wood, and then in time, they'd have noticed the little spring bubbling up along among its roots in spite of the pebbles piled there so to conceal it. And that would have been a disaster so immense that this weary old earth, owned or not to its fiery core, would have trembled on its axis like a beetle on a pin.